Morning, everybody. I'm going to keep you standing for a second. Petty Officer Catherine, where are you? Come here. You think you're in trouble, don't you? Yes, sir. Stand right there. Attention to award, please. This is to certify the Secretary of the Navy has awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, Gold Star in lieu of second award, to Mass Communication Specialist, Second Class Surface Warfare, Aviation Warfare, David J. Cothran, for professional achievement while serving as Assistant Web Developer, developer for Navy Production Directorate and Defense Media Activity, Fort Meade, from August to September 2013. Petty Officer Cothran's outstanding initiative led to the development and launch of an All Hands Magazine archive website featuring 10 decades of content. He worked tirelessly to make more than 1,000 digital magazine editions available to a worldwide audience. He personally wrote more than 100,000 lines of HTML code to construct a professional archive site that is easy to navigate and increased web traffic to Navy.mil by 450,000 hits. Petty Officer Cothran's exceptional professionalism, unrelenting perseverance, and loyal devotion to duty reflected great credit upon him and were in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Signed the 6th day of September 2013 by J. F. Kirby, Rear Admiral, U.S. Navy. Congratulations, Chef. Thank Thanks, sir. Appreciate what you did. Thank you, sir. A round of applause, please. <laughs> Let's get a picture of Take a seat. All right, now you can sit down. That's the best way to start one of these things. And I think we surprised you, didn't we? You didn't know this was coming, did you? No, sir. Good. Um, well, that little spot NAM speaks a lot about uh, a lot of the, it covers, it pull, there's, a, there's a thread you can pull through this through a lot of what I want to talk about today. And I'm essentially going to, I'm going to try to keep my, my yakking as short as I can. But there's sort of three things I want to hit on. One, I want to just give you a quick update on our community, the health of the community. Uh, two, I want to talk about the budget outlook for next year, which is dominating a, a lot of my time and attention. Uh, and then I just want to talk a little bit about my own priorities. What, what I tried to focus on in year one, because I'm now just beginning year two, so I want to kind of go quickly through what I, what I tried to do in year one and why, and then get to year two and where my focus is going to be heading into this uh, this next uh, phase of my time as Chinfo, and then I just want to take questions, and hopefully we'll get lots. So let me go on the community update. Um, I'll just start with the enlisted side. I think, well, actually, both on the officer and enlisted side, we're healthy, uh, and, and the civilian side too. We're we're healthy. Um, on the enlisted side, we're a 101 percent man. That's pretty good. Uh, we consider it as a relatively balanced community. Um, and, uh, but we do have some trouble years in terms of re-enlistment quotas. I'm, you know, perform to serve has gone away, but there are still some year groups on the enlisted side that have to uh, get permission to re-enlist. They still have to apply for that. Uh, that's 1999, 2000, 2002, and 2005. Um, it's going to take us a little while to work through that, uh, but by and large, we're manned pretty healthy. And, the focus is, as it is for all the enlisted communities, on at sea manning, and that's where we're putting a lot of our energy and time and making sure that uh, float units have the, the people that they need, which means that there are some ash places ashore where uh, we're taking some hits. One of them is at Dinfos, for instance, and instructors are at Dinfos. Uh, we're also not filling all our recruiter uh, quotas as well, but we're, um, we're trying to work through that. Advancement opportunities on the enlisted side? are pretty good. Um, so next year, we're going to have slightly lower advancement for E4, should stay steady at E5, slightly lower at E6, and just a little bit lower at E7. Uh, although E7 advancement still looks very, very good. I don't want to cause any great alarm by that. As we, you know, we made another Master Chief quota here, one more, right, for next year. So that means that, uh, in general, promotion to Chief is still going to be pretty healthy. Uh, so that's good on the enlisted side. On the officer side, I'd also say we're pretty balanced and we're pretty healthy. We're at 96.3% manned in the active component. Um, Vic Beck is here, um, and uh, if, uh, if you get a chance, I'll just ask you to talk quickly about uh, how you're doing on the reserve side. But on the active side, we're at 96.3% and pretty, uh, looking pretty good. I think, according to, the, uh, to Commander Nunnally and Commander Miller, we should be, by this fall, we should actually get up to 100%. 
so that's a good thing. And we're working hard on the accession thing. Um, as you know, in the officer community, we, we, we get very few opportunities to bring them in as ensigns, usually three to five a year. Uh, and so most of our officer sessions are at the lieutenant rank, and those are uh, lateral transfers. And again, I think our outlook for next year looks pretty, pretty healthy. Um, the only real uh, cohort that bothers me is 05s. We're still undermanned at uh, the commander level. We're down about eight to nine bodies, given the requirements out there for 05s. Uh, that may not sound like a lot, but when you're a community as small as us, it does mean a lot. We're going to try to get at that, you know, take a, a, a bite out of that uh, wedge uh, through promotion opportunities and the, uh, and, the, um, and the zones coming up in the next year or two. So uh, more on that as I know it. Uh, and then on the civilian side, again, I think things are holding steady. We're looking for more training and education opportunities for our civilians at DINFOS and other places of learning. Uh, and as you know, the furloughs are now over. I think we ended up with three furlough days. Um, huh? Was it? You know, six, but, but we, cut them, we cut them short from six. We didn't actually do six. Um, did it? We did six? That's right, 11 to six. Thank you. I'm sure, I'm sure you remembered each of those days. <laughs> anyway, it's over. That's a good thing. And I don't know what it's going to look like for next year, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. In fact, I'll just go to it right now. Budget for next year. Um, it's going to be a tough one. I, I said this the last time I was here, uh, and, uh, and I'll say it again. I think in 14, we need to, to prepare for the, the very strong likelihood of sequestration in 14. I think it's also entirely likely that we'll be dealing with a continuing resolution uh, in the first six months or so of next year. I mean, uh, this is September 6th, right? Or is it? Yeah. And uh, October 1st is just around the corner, and I, I don't think it's very likely that we're going to get an appropriations bill for FY14 on October 1st. So we're looking at a CR. We're certainly looking at sequestration. Uh, and for us in the Navy, uh, 14, if we're sequestered in 14, it's going to be, it's going to have a bigger impact than, than what we faced in 13. Uh, we're looking at probably instead of a, a normal 10% cut from sequestration, if you add on the complexities of 13 to 14, uh, it's not just 10%, it comes out to about 14% uh, a cut across the board for us uh, in the Navy. And you can't touch the manpower accounts. Uh, so that means that you have, to, you have to go after that money uh, where you have it and, that's gonna, and where you can, and that's in the OMEN accounts, the operating accounts, and procurement, R&D and procurement acquisition, that kind of thing. Uh, and so the CNO and the staff are working really hard to figure this out. Uh, I, I got to attend a, a brief uh, meeting uh, the CNO had yesterday getting ready for a hearing he's got later this month in the House Armed Services Committee to talk about uh, the strategic choices management review and sequestration in, in a hearing. And I think there will be others, not just this Hask hearing. Uh, so he's working hard at this to try to figure it out. It's going to have an impact on the way we deploy, the way we train, um, the readiness that levels that we're able to sustain out there, and it's also going to have an impact on virtually every program. I mean, uh, if we get sequestered uh, in 14, uh, we could lose an LCS. Uh, we're, uh, we're likely to, to lose, I, th I think it's a, a DDG, uh, and, there's, and then there's going to be an impact to the JSF program as well. So there's, and that's just a, a few off the top. It's going to touch just about everything. Uh, so serious problems across the Navy, and that will affect us. As I've said before, the budget isn't for us, it's not just a communication challenge, it is, because we have an obligation to explain to the, our sailors and our families and the American people what this means for us. But it also is gonna have a real impact on CHINFO, the PA community, and our ability to do our jobs. And the biggest impact is on outreach. Uh, now, you know, uh, for 13, we basically, we did all but shut down outreach in 13. And we did, uh, and I, ha I hands off to Kim Marks and her team and Rob Knoll, for the work they did to try to get some outreach accomplished, mostly virtually through 13. Um, uh, and, but in 14, it, it's, it's still an unclear picture. That said, I am cautiously optimistic that we're going to be able to get, to, to get out back on the road next year. Uh, Rob has done amazing work uh, with Kim and her team to come up with some proposals that we think will be acceptable to OSD leadership that could help us get back out there. 
it may, and I foot stomp the word may here because Secretary Hagel gets to make the final decision and I don't think he's been briefed on any of this, but it may include getting the blues back up in the air, uh, maybe some port visits uh, to CONUS pl uh, ports, um, not all of our Navy weeks, but about a half a dozen or so, uh, and our participation in uh, all five fleet weeks. That's a good thing. That's what we want. It's a, it, it represents, that kind of a plan would represent a, about a 40%, maybe a little bit more than a 40% cut uh, in what we did in 2012. So it's, I mean, it shows some pain, uh, but I think it's doable. More importantly, um, Ms. Bardorf at OSD Community Relations thinks it's doable. All the services are facing cuts in their outreach and are making similar accommodations. But this plan needs to be briefed up the chain of command, and we don't, so we don't have approval yet. Bottom line is we're trying real hard to find innovative, creative solutions uh, to get back out there because we believe, I know you know this, uh, I believe it, but even the CNO, and he, we've talked about this, he believes that outreach is a mission. It's not a luxury. It's not something you just do because you can. Uh, you really need to do it. And it's particularly acute for us in the Navy because Unlike the other services, we don't have bases all around middle America. We need this outreach uh, effort to communicate with Americans where they, where they are and where we aren't. And because so many of our missions require us to be out and about. So it's really, really important for us. Um, again, Rob's done a great job teeing it up. We, we teed up several options. That's the one we prefer. There are, as you might imagine, other options that are more restrictive and one or two that are less restrictive. But I think that's where we're probably going to end up going, I hope. So the budget's real. Uh, we all need to be braced for more pain next year, and then we'll see about 15 and beyond. I mean, I, there, are, there are planners uh, here in the building that are certainly looking at FY15 and beyond uh, to see what sequestration looks like. It's pretty dire when you get out that way. I, I think if, if sequestri sequestration continues, uh, you're gonna see even more uh, dramatic decisions being made in 15 and beyond on, to certain programs and initiatives uh, across the Navy. But it's, that's where we are, and I'm happy to take questions when we get to that point about the, about the budget. I wish I had better news. But as I said, if there's a silver lining in here, it is that I think we're going to be able to get some outreach done. We're going to be able to get back out to America, and that's important. Okay, let me just talk a little bit about what I tried to do in year one. And I, none of this should come as a surprise, but I want to just recap it. I had two major concerns coming into the job or two things I really wanted to work on. One was relationships. I'd been away from the community for a long time and I wanted to get, take more time to get to know all of you, let you get to know me. So I've made some trips um, to fleet concentration areas. I'll, I'll continue to do that, but I really wanted to work on getting to know the community again and the issues inside the Navy. I also wanted to work on relationships here in the building. I mean, I have, because I've been in the building since 2005, I have a lot of relationships, but I didn't have any necessarily with the headquarters of the Navy. So I worked hard on building a good relationship with Secretary Mavis and with the CNO and the OPNAV staff and the SECNAV staff. Uh, and I still have work to do there. I mean, relationships, as I wrote about not long ago, are something that must be constantly nurtured and sustained. So you're never really going to get to the finish line on that, nor should you try. Uh, so I'm going to continue to do that. But that was a real big focus area for me. Um, the other the other focus area for me was what I call blocking and tackling skills, fundamentals, back to basics kind of things. Um, I was worried uh, that in, in some ways we were sort of moving away from the very roots of good public relations. Not that the PA community was on the wrong track or going south, I didn't mean anything like that. It's just that there were some basic skills uh, that I wanted to make sure we were paying a lot more attention to. So I did that. And, uh, you guys have seen the team PAs that I write, and I do write them myself, uh, and I think about them before I send them to you. Uh, they're all designed to sort of just remind us of some basic responsibilities that we have and skill sets that I want us to not only hone and master, but, but to sustain, like writing and speaking and media relations and, and talking to people. Uh, so, so I worked on that. I think I'll continue to do that because I'm a simple guy. I don't think uh, in very lofty terms. Uh, and those things still matter to me. So you're going to continue to hear that from me as well. So again, two of my goals I'm going to take forward uh, into the year number two. And then the third one was the program and the budget. And I, and I made this a priority in year one because, A, it's a 
real priority to the Navy. I mean, you just heard me talk about the effect of sequestration in 13 and 14. It's what we're living with every day, but also because I didn't understand any of it. I mean, I had come from four years on the Joint Staff where almost all the work I did was operational or in uh, traveling around with Admiral Mullen, more geopolitical in nature. Uh, and then I spent a year as Secretary Panetta's spokesman up at the podium, and again, that was largely driven by the news of the day. I did not have to worry about diesel generators on the littoral combat ship uh, or the cost of the Ford-class carrier. Um, now I do. That's the, that's the life of the Chinfo, and, it's, uh, and I embrace that, and I've had to work hard on that and trying to understand it. And uh, it's important just for the sake of knowing it, but also because of the budget environment that we're living in. So again, I think I'll continue to focus on that as well going into uh, year number two. So when I, thought, when I think about uh, this coming year uh, and what I want to spend my time on, I kind of bend it um, along the lines of those three words that are on the back of my coin, content, context, and counsel. Those three words have guided me for 22 years as a PAO, and I'm going to use them to guide me here in year number two. So as I think about how I'm going to organize my efforts, it's going to be along those three lines. And I'll just hit them briefly with you. Uh, I'm actually doing pretty good on time, too. I'll just hit them briefly with you. Uh, on content, um, and, and, and content for me is, is the, it's the raw material. It's, it's the words we choose. It's the things we write. It's, the, the, it's what we say, and it's certainly the visual imagery that goes along with that. Uh, but it also is the material that's guiding our leaders. So you got the CNO's three tenants, which he has reaffirmed for uh, this year that he's going to maintain those. That's war fighting first, uh, operate forward, and be ready. And then it also relates to the secretary's four P's that he calls them, his four, his four P's and priorities. That's platforms, power, partnerships, and people. Uh, and I think you're going to see the secretary in particular over the next few months uh, start to get out there in speaking venues and talk about those four P's. Um, we're looking at a perhaps a, um, a speech next week, as a matter of fact, at, at the National Defense University, where he's going to start to kind of unveil this strategy of his, um, starting with what, what he calls the overarching P, and that's presence. That's, that's the big thing that naval forces provide the president and the country, and I think he's going he's to sort of really kind of unravel that uh, next week in a big speech. So we have an obligation at Chinfo, because we don't just speak for the Navy, uh, but I am also the Navy Department's spokesman to help the Secretary articulate that vision, and we're going to do that. So that's the raw material. It's the three tenants and it's the four Ps. That, those are our bosses. That's what matters to them, so it, it's the first thing that matters to me. Uh, and so what we've got to do is, is translate those priorities into compelling content from our perspective. Um, number one, it, the number one goal in that, or the number one thing we need to be focused on is good storytelling. And you've heard me talk about this. I'm not going to belabor that. Uh, and I wrote about this as well in a Team PA, but we have to be better storytellers. Not saying we're not good storytellers. We are, but we can always get better, and we need to do that. So we're working on some ideas to help us get a little bit better. Um, uh, what I, what I want to make sure, and I'll, I, 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 mean, I said this before, I'll say it again, but I want the MCs, particularly, because they're the ones who really, uh, in our community, develop the content. And when I think about content, that's who I think about mostly. I want them loosened up and freed up to do the kind of good storytelling we need. Um, I hear, wherever I go uh, to the fleet concentration areas I've visited, I hear repeatedly from MCs who feel constrained by the chain of command, whether it's their public affairs chain of, chain of command or the operational chain of command at the unit they're in, uh, not, to, not to be able to tell compelling stories. And it's not that they're told, hey, I don't want you to tell good stories, but what they're told is, just put it in AP style, give me a news release, let's post it at the Navy.mil and be done with it. Not good enough. We still need to do that, of course. There's going to be, and we still have to know how to, how to, how to submit and, uh, and release a good press release, but that's just, that's just a task. What I really want, I want skill, and I want them to be able to let their skills go. And, and let, them, let them work on these things and come up with creative ideas. It's one of the reasons why I saved All Hands Magazine from the trash heap, because I believe it's a great form to do that. And it is. It's getting better and better every month. The submissions are getting sharper. I continue to be incredibly impressed by the talent out there. 
when I go see MCs in the field, particularly uh, on aircraft carriers. Uh, because a lot of times they're given a lot of leeway to be creative out there. And the submissions coming from the fleet are increasing and they're getting better and better, but we still got to keep working at it. So we've got to do a better job telling stories. Um, I'm dispatching Master Chief to, uh, where are you going, Pac Northwest, San Diego, and Norfolk, uh, to start conducting some workshops on the waterfront uh, with senior MCs in those areas on good storytelling. So if you're listening to me and you're here but out there, uh, please show up to these workshops, um, contribute to them, speak up, uh, make your ideas known, and start contributing to this, this, uh, this much bigger and broader initiative about good storytelling. We've got to do a better job. I talked about, um, uh, you may have heard me talk about this book I read not long ago called The Far Shore written by a guy named Max Miller. Mark Farron from Navy Times turned, turned me on to this book. If you got 10 bucks, uh, you don't make, the book is not in, in uh, print anymore, but if you got 10 bucks, go on Amazon.com and buy this book. It's a little thin thing, 200 pages, you can read it in a weekend. Max Miller was a civilian journalist, uh, just a reporter, and the Navy hired him in World War II, gave him the rank of lieutenant commander, and hired him to go tell the Navy story. Uh, and he wrote this book called The Far Shore, which was about the amphibious landings of World War II in the Mediterranean. Uh, so he wrote about uh, Salerno and Normandy and Anzio uh, and others. Uh, and he wrote it from the perspective, not of the grunts, uh, but from the sailors, particularly the coxswains, uh, the young sailors that had to bring these, these Marines and these soldiers ashore and then get back and get another load. Pretty powerful stuff. Uh, he really puts you right in the time and the place. It's compelling writing because it's good storytelling. He's talking about the Navy's role in World War II, but he's doing it through the eyes of sailors. And that's a skill we can all master, and we all should. Because service in the Navy uh, is not about the stuff. It's not about the ships or the submarines or the aircraft. We're a capital-intensive service, to be sure, but it's about us. It's about what made you come in. It's, it's about the dedication, it's about loyalty, and it's, it's about the things that matter to you that you can't measure that are inside here. We, um, I'm getting off topic here, and I know now I am running out of time, but um, you may have heard of an effort that we, we, we launched recently with Gallup, sending them down to Norfolk and San Diego to do some, uh, to do some uh, focus groups about who we are as sailors. Now, there was a little piece of it, to be honest, that uh, uh, was about sort of test, test running global force for good. Because um, the CNO asked me when I took the job, hey, let me know if that's really where we want to be in terms of uh, a brand for the Navy. So that was one of the questions we asked sailors. We asked them a lot of other ones. Uh, and they did great work for us. They did 19 focus groups in, in two fleet concentration areas. Um, uh, 17, with, 17 of the focus groups were with sailors ranking from E1 all the way to 06. Um, uh, folks from ashore commands, afloat commands, all kinds of diversity. And then in each concentration area, they also sat with a group of veterans. And really what I wanted to know was what does service in the Navy mean to people? I won't bore you with the whole brief. Uh, we can give you the slides. It's pretty compelling stuff. I briefed it to the CNO and to the three stars a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Admiral Moran ha has it now, and he's he's going to sort of take this, this issue of Global Force for Good on and, and move forward. But when I asked Gallup, okay, bottom line, um, is it possible for a, for a service as diverse as the Navy, s cut across so many skill sets, uh, to have a single idea, call it a brand, a motto, I don't care what you call it, but is it possible for us to have an idea, a one thread that everybody can sign up to and say, yeah, that speaks to me, that's who I am? Their answer was yes. You can, but there was a caveat. They said, you've got to pull at the emotional strings because it's clear from the focus group answers to the questions we asked that what matters to people about being in the Navy is what's in here. It's not the stuff they get to fly and drive and operate. It's, it's what being in the Navy means to them. Many of them have family connections. I'm sure many of you do as well. So they said, if you're going to come up with something, Kirby, it's got to have something that pulls on the heartstrings. So there's, there's an intangible here to the content that I want us to develop. And the only way we're going to get there is if we tell good stories about who we are, the human experience about being in the Navy. Okay, that's content. I know I'm running out of time. I'll get to context. 
Uh, as you heard me talk about, context is really more, in my mind, about... Uh, I've lost my cards here. There we go. Um, this is getting a little bit beyond the blocking and tackling skills. I'm still going to focus on fundamentals in year two because I still think it's something you can never stop worrying about, the basic skills. But where I want us to get to is a, is a higher plane of operation uh, where we are really helping provide understanding, providing understanding and awareness uh, to, to the American people in particular, but also to the press that we work with. This requires a little bit more dexterity in how we deal with reporters and how we deal with people. It's not just about producing talking points, and we've done that. You know, we got the, the weekly playbook, which was another product I wanted to start doing here in year one. Uh, and we're going to continue that. But I want to take the level of discussion about the Navy to a higher level. It's particularly important now as we're facing these budget pressures. Now as we're, we may not be able to get out amongst the American people as much as we want. This is the time to be up in the game in terms of what we're talking about and how we're talking about it. So what do you mean by that, Kirby? Well, I mean, we got to get more comfortable in other settings than on-the-record interviews and speeches. You know, we've got to, we as PAOs, but our leaders, the ones we work for, we got to get them on background. We got to get them off the record. We got to get them to, to engage more, to have more conversations out there. Uh, and again, it's even more important now uh, if outreach comes back at all uh, that we get ourselves and our leaders comfortable with that. It's, I, I think the other thing we learned in this, because uh, I had Gallup do some other polling for me too. One of the things I learned was it, the American people, they know why they have a Navy. Nothing drives me more batty than when I'm walking around and I hear other flag and general officers talk about, well, we got to explain why the Navy, why the, the nation needs a Navy. They, they know why they have a Navy. They get it. They've always had a Navy. It's gone up in size and down. It's gone up in capability and down, but they, we've always had a Navy. We have to do a better job explaining what that Navy does. You know, I've joked about it, but my mom still thinks we have battleships, but, but but that's, that's just a, and it's true, and that's just, a, uh, that's just a statement about how much more education we have to do. And that's going to require, again, a little bit uh, more focus on a, a deeper level of understanding. It's also why um, I'm focusing on training and education a little bit more this year. Um, and we're going to try to stand up a public affairs uh, course at the Naval War College. This would be an elective taught by uh, probably an 05 or an 06 PAO. Uh, eventually, the goal is that this individual is permanently detailed to Newport and is not the War College PAO. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get there, but we're working with the War College uh, faculty uh, to kind of develop this, but I want it taught by a PAO, and I'm going to call it something other than public affairs because that's not what I want it to be about, but I, I want it to be about public communication. Again, I want us, we have to provide some context and awareness to our own Navy about what we bring to the effort and to the fight. It's also one of the reasons why, and I wrote about this a couple of weeks ago, on internships. I want to, uh, I want to look at informal internship relationships in Washington, uh, Norfolk, San Diego, and out in Hawaii. Uh, Captain James is all over that. He was all excited about this, and he's off and running, as is Captain Campbell. Uh, she's uh, already having conversations with the Virginia pilot about uh, doing this sort of informal internship uh, program. Uh, we're going to do it here, as I said, in D.C. I, I don't want it. It doesn't have to be codified. I just want an opportunity for our junior officers and our MCs to get outside a little bit, to, to go be a part of a media outlet, even if it's just for a week, even if it's just for a day. Just see what it's like out there. See what it, what it takes to put a news package together for a cable network. See what an editorial board meeting looks like from the inside. How does the news get developed and disseminated on a daily basis? How does a paper get put together? Um, that's a good context for us to have because we're not going to be able to convince our bosses, our commands about the importance of what we do if we don't understand the business of news gathering itself and how much the, that business is changing. You've heard me talk about my meeting with Al Jazeera, Josh Rushing uh, and uh, Jeremy Young from Al Jazeera not long ago. and uh, I'll, I'll just retell it quickly even though I know I'm over time now. Um, but I, they, Jeremy asked me, he's a producer at Al Jazeera, asked me, you know, what has social media and technology done for the to the business of public relations. My, my one word answer was speed. It's just kind of sped everything up. And I turned the question around on Jeremy. I said, what's it done to the business of news gathering? And his one word answer back to me was everything. It's changed everything. Because not only do we have to be ahead of it, but it itself becomes part of the news. 
So all, there is an enormous amount of change going on out there in the news media industry, and we gotta, we got to be a part of that. we got to understand that. We have to walk in their shoes just a little bit because uh, it will make us better communicators on our part. Okay, and then that brings me to, to counsel, uh, the third C, and I, what I'm going to focus on uh, in this year. Um, we're going to, uh, for, first of all, back to training education, we've asked DINFOS to add some tasks into their training that, uh, that include advising the commander and staff as an actual training task in some of their curriculum, so that's a good thing. Um, I'm going to, uh, it's something I've been trying to do for, for a whole year and I just haven't been able to get there, but I think I'm about there now. Uh, I'm really going to develop OI9 as a strategy shop. Captain Mike Skelton is on board now. Thanks, Mike. Um, and uh, he's got a deputy now, so there's actually manpower applied to OI9, and we're going to get him some more help. Uh, but I sat Ike down when he reported aboard here just a few days ago, and I told him that I want him to be the brain. I want him to think out ahead. What, where we get too often caught up in our community, and certainly at Chinfo, is in the, what's, what's in front of me today. What are the headlines i got to deal with? What are the media queries I'm chasing down? Uh, and that's important stuff. Reactivity is not a bad word in our profession. It's a good word. Uh, but where I want to be is active, and I want to be out ahead of the headlines. I want to be out ahead of events. Uh, and so my task to Ike is, I want a strategy shop. I want to think long term. I want to know what is going on six or eight months from now that i got to care about, and how Chinfo is going to have a role, how our community is going to have a role in shaping those events. Not just communicating them, but shaping them, and shaping the decisions that our bosses don't even know right now they have to make. So it's no small task. I appreciate you taking that on. But it's a big job, and that's what I want. I want to get out ahead. That's about me. I, no, it's not about me. I, that wasn't a good way to put it. Um, when I look back at year one, I think uh, I've made a lot of mistakes. But one of the things I know I haven't done a good job of is giving good strategic counsel to the secretary and to the CNO. Uh, I'm building good relationships with both men, and I'm happy about where those are going. But I think I can do a better job helping them understand events and getting ahead of the, the tyranny of their time as well. And that's what I want OI9 to do, and that's where I want to get to. And that, frankly, I think that's where we all should try to get to as, as public affairs professionals. Um, and I talked about the War College. And then the last thing on here is just expanding networks. Um, what I mean by that is, and I, and I talked about this in my last TPA, this is about your own networks, your own Rolodexes. Uh, I want you to, now I know we don't use Rolodexes anymore. I still do. Um, well, you call it what you want, your contact list on your Outlook account, whatever. But take a look at it every now and then. And I mean literally take a look at it and see who's on there. And ask yourself who isn't on there that ought to be on there, whether it's somebody inside the community or outside the community, whether it's a reporter, a producer, a bureau chief, uh, or another another colleague that's not even in, uh, not even in uh, the military. Uh, just take a look at who's on that contact list uh, and scrub it. And if there's somebody on that contact list that you want to keep and you haven't talked to in a while, pick up the phone and call them. Or walk down the hall and go see them. Uh, it really is about relationships, what we do. It, when it, it, it all comes down to human interaction. Uh, and that's what we got to spend more time on. So with that as a great way to get off the stage here, I'm five minutes over I want it to be. But with the, the goal of human interaction, I'll love you to take any questions or comments you guys have. Nothing, huh? Yes. Sir, Lieutenant Bennett, Chinfo, I and I. Sir, if you could give a grade to uh, the public affairs community and how we are doing in integrating our communication efforts, what would it be and what would it take to get us to either the next letter or the next plus? What do you mean by communicating our efforts? I just mean from the most important things to the CNO and the SECNAV and how that uh, th those strategies, those plans, those mm -hmm. desires, those ideas get communicated all the way through, all the way to the, to the lowest levels. I, if I was going to swag, I'd just sit down and relax. I'd say uh, B or B plus. I mean, I think we're doing good. I mean, not, it, it's not like we aren't performing out there. I think we are. Um, we've got an amazing talent all across the community, um, but I don't want us to be patting ourselves on the back too much. You know, it's things are changing too fast, and uh, the decision space that our leaders are are 
working with is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Just look at what's going on in Syria right now. Uh, so we can do better. Um, and, and I think, you know, the CNO is very good about talking about his three tenets, and, and he, he works that into almost every discussion he has publicly. And you're going to start to see the same focus effort coming from Secretary Mabus now that he's got his four P's down and, and he's got the structure. Um, and I just, uh, so I think we got probably more work to do on the four P's just because it's, a, it's sort of a new idea and he's just starting to launch this. Um, but I, I think we do a good job. I mean, we, we do a good job explaining the Navy to people. I just think we can do a little bit better job. And we're, uh, two, two components of that. One is timeliness. It's just being faster. Uh, we, we still are sometimes a little slow on the uptake. Uh, because we want to staff everything and make sure it's all right. I'd rather get out there and into a story, even with a, a holding statement that's not too specific, but at least we're in the discussion, and then update it later with more information than not be in it at all. So it's, it's, uh, it's the timeliness thing, and then I think it's just, uh, it's just an effort of, uh, it's just a, a matter of constant care and attention and feeding to this thing. The, one, the other thing about this information environment that, we, that we're living in is it's, um, there's no end to it. The, 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 you know, even a story, um, stories are constantly updated. Even wire stories are constantly updated. And so you look at the early bird, that used to mean, or the Chinfo clips, that used to be, that was the news of the day. You get it delivered on your desk, you read it, that's the news of the day. And we all know that that's not the case anymore. Because an hour or so after the early bird hits the streets or the Chinfo clips are done, there's a whole rash of new stories, and sometimes those are the stories that are driving our day. Again, Syria is a great example of this, not what's in the early bird. And what's in the early bird, a story by Kim Dozier, and Kim's a great reporter, but you'll see oftentimes, and she'll update her stories throughout the day, adding new quotes, adding fresh data, removing old stuff. I mean, it's not just the, it's not just the news cycle that is this constant, ever-changing thing. A story itself is now a living, breathing thing. That, that doesn't just lay on the desk and die after you've read it. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Um, we have a couple questions. We have a couple questions coming from the uh, WebEx here. This one comes in from Jason Kelly. Sir, you mentioned internship opportunities for junior officers and MCs. Will civilians be offered this opportunity absolutely. as well? Absolutely, yeah, I neglected to say that. But absolutely, our civilians will be should be and will be offered opportunities to do the internships. That's my bad. I should have said that. That's absolutely right. In fact, is Caroline here? Where's Caroline? Is she here? Is she? Yeah, I mean, she jumped at this as soon as I said it. She wants to be the first one. Uh, absolutely, civilians will be a part of it. You bet. Ryan? Come in, Ryan Perry. Um, so you mentioned Syria briefly. Uh, it's the issue kind of at the front of America's consciousness right now. The Navy's right in the middle of it. Can you discuss for everybody a little bit how you're able to balance your commitment to truth and transparency while at the same time not getting ahead of national decision-making processes at the highest levels? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, this is a constant balance that that we have to seek as public affairs professionals, particularly in, in, with a, a situation as dynamic right now as Syria is. There's two ways to look at this, or there's two things you gotta think about. One is the, the right of the American people to, to know what's being done with their military, the sons and daughters that they send uh, out there to defend them and the equipment that they're buying. And operational security, uh, and you have to find the, the right balance there. Um, clearly, when you have an, a situation like Syria that's unfolding really before our eyes through the news, um, finding that balance becomes that much harder, uh, and you can't divulge classified information, and you don't want to tell potentially bad actors, you know, where all your th people are, and and what they're doing, on the other hand, you've got to at least bound it and, and try to put some context to it so that at the very least, in, in our case, 
people know that the Navy's out there, uh, that, that we're doing exactly what we've been paid to do, exactly what the Commander-in-Chief expects us to be able to do, which is to provide a, a, a force in being, a presence, uh, that can be a deterrent uh, or can be offensive uh, in capability. And so we've tried to do that um, as, as the last couple of weeks have unfolded. And we've been, and the other, the other piece to Ryan's question is to try to coordinate that as much as you can so that you're not just doing this all under the table, that we're keeping the Joint Staff and OSD informed not only of what the Navy's doing, but what we're going to talk about what the Navy's doing. And again, we've thread that needle pretty carefully, and I, I, uh, and I think we're going to have to continue to do that. I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know what the plans are. I, I don't get to look at those. I don't know what uh, the commander in chief's ultimately going to decide to do, and I don't know how the vote's going to come out in Congress. I mean, I'm reading the news same as you on the debates over there. Um, but this is this is the topic of national conversation right now, and primarily, whatever response is being considered will be a Navy response. We're 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 gonna if there's a response, we're gonna play. We're gonna be involved in that. Uh, so we have to continue to try to find that find balance and walk that very thin line about transparency uh, to, to the very limit that we can go. Uh, and I don't want to go over that limit, but I want to be right at that limit uh, because it's important. Again, back to what I talked about before, about the American people not really understanding what we do. This is an opportunity, and I'm not, I don't want to come across as crass or like I'm trying to take advantage of a crisis here. Uh, but it, is, it does provide us an opportunity to educate people about what capabilities the Navy brings uh, to an effort like this. And so we're, we're, we're doing that. Uh, again, it's just going to be, I think every day, Ryan and I are both learning every day that, uh, that striking that balance gets harder and harder um, as events seem to be moving faster and faster uh, in Syria. The... the the thing that I think people have, we've tried hard to correct, but I think the thing that bothers me the most about the narrative out there on the Eastern Med is this idea that you know, we surged four or five destroyers to the Eastern Med and we, we, you know, we moved all this effort, this, this, this manpower, this machinery to the Eastern Med, and that's just not true. We know that. I mean, the truth is we keep two to three destroyers in the Eastern Med all the time anyway. And the fourth one that we're talking about was simply on the way over anyway to relieve one of those three. And, and that's something we do need to work on and we do need to improve, I think, awareness of. That, uh, that it isn't, yet we are a surge-capable force, but we are also present in a lot of parts of the world already. The, 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 the time, we talked about the decision space for our leaders to make, to make the, the time that they have to make decisions and how short it is and getting shorter. One of the things that we do for the commander in chief is help him with that time. We actually give time back to the president because we're already there. So he and our nation's leaders don't have to worry about, well, geez, where's the nearest carrier and how fast is it gonna take to get there? Uh, because oftentimes, particularly in the hot spots of the world, we are already there in some form or fashion. Did that answer your question? Admiral, we have another question coming in from the WebEx here. This one comes from Captain Kirchner. What are your thoughts on how the Navy Reserve PA community is organized to support the active component's mission? Well, I'm going to ask Vic to come up. I, I'll just say broadly, uh, and we get, we get this question from time to time, Vic and I. Um, uh, from my view, I'm not aware of any organizational changes that need to occur. I'm very pleased with the reserve support that we get. And I'll say it again. I've said this a, a a billion times. There is no way, no way, uh, that we could have gotten through the last 10 to 12 years of war, Iraq and Afghanistan uh, particularly, without our reserve component. Impossible. Can't be done. There's no way we could have done it with the active component. It's our reservists. You go look at, look at the service jackets of our, of our reserves and you'll see a lot of time on the ground. Uh, lots of bronze stars. Now, these guys and and I'd say guys to mean the whole group, men and women, they have 
they have fought and they have deployed again and again, and there's no way uh, that we could have done it without them. So I'm very I'm ecstatic about the support we get from the reserve community. Again, I'm not aware of any organizational changes that need to occur or are pending, but I'll t pass it over to you, Vic. Just real quick, um, one of the things, uh, let me put on my businessman hat for a minute. One of the things I did as uh, Vice Chinfo was, uh, I call it a business efficiency review. And uh, we didn't, it wasn't a wholesale change at all, but we looked at billets. And we need to do that, um, really, and for my relief, uh, Admiral Select Davis, he needs to do it too, once, once in, a, in their tour. And it's something we always have to do. We constantly look at uh, the business of our Navy. And so there wasn't any wholesale change. I don't see any wholesale changes, but you have to study it at least every three years. Take a hard look at where our billets are, um, where, where we're located, um, and a little bit of mostly just restructure a little bit. Uh, but restructure is a tough word. It's not, a, uh, it's not the right word here. It's really uh, look, tweaks. But I think we're structured correctly in support of, uh, uh, of the active force, and so you guys can easily uh, tap us with need be. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Admiral. Lieutenant Hutchison on the news desk. I apologize if my question is a bit news desk or even programming specific, but hopefully it can apply to... If it's about the program, folks. you should answer it, not me. <laughs> hopefully it can apply to folks with multiple number one priorities. Um, on the news desk, our job is to communicate your intent while also working for multiple principals um, who under a normal budget environment kind of you know, shape our, or create um, our undersea surface and aviation force. But you know, the reality is that um, in this environment they become conflicting priorities or at least lines of funding. So how do we um, balance being good PAOs to our principals but also being thoughtful and realistic and not just, you know, doing a, a blog on LCS and then a blog on a high replacement and then a blog on JSF because they're all important to each of our individual folks, but yeah. you know, there's, there's a reality there. How, how are we strategic in that? Yeah, there's reality there. <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, yeah. it, you know what? It's about picking and choosing your battles. That's what it really comes down to. I mean, when I, when I think about what your question really gets to, it, it's about deciding what hills you want to die on and which ones you're willing to just bypass. And so uh, it's a good thing that principals want to communicate and want to write and want to blog and want to be out there. Um, and my predilection would be to tell you to allow them to do that, allow them that space, encourage that, uh, help them get it right, um, but not be afraid if the timing's wrong. It, 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 you know, just, to slow them down a little bit, or maybe next week's a better week for this. Um, but don't turn off that creativity. Don't, you know, you don't, you don't want to discourage them from being out there and talking. That's what the CNO wants, and I think we all benefit when they're out there. Um, it's about helping them get that message right and then work in the timing and, and, the, and the placement. Sometimes it is a blog, sometimes it's a speech, sometimes it's an op-ed piece or whatever. Um, but you, as the as the account holder there uh, in three, you're you've got a bigger picture in in many ways than the principals do because you have multiple accounts and you can see how they are all interconnected, particularly around budget time. Uh, and you, and so your job is to be okay, I, is to say I I know you want to write this, I know it's really important, but let's let's hang let's hang out for a little bit. The GAO report's coming out in three weeks, and that's a better time to do this. Uh, so it's, it's about picking and choosing the battles. Um, and sometimes it's just easier and gets you more credibility down the road if you just let something go. M maybe you really don't like it or you don't think it's necessary. But if it's not going to hurt anything and it allows your principals a chance to talk and to communicate, um, my advice would be to let it go. Uh, and then that way when there's a time that comes, and it really is matters to you that not to have this out there or to have it said a different way and it, and it, it it's significant that we are your concerns are significant uh, then you can you'll have more credibility when you go in there and say okay look this time no this time you need to wait or this time you need to say it this way 
So it's really about, and I make these judgments every day myself. It's what battles do you really want to fight and which ones are, are just not worth it. Um, and that, that requires a, a level of, uh, of self-awareness and maturity too. That I mean, we get everybody, and you see this happening in American society in general, it's very polarizing. Everybody gets wedded to their view of you pick it, the, the, the world, the, the economy, healthcare, whatever it is. Everybody has a very staunch view. And, uh, you, you, any, any lurker like me on Facebook can see that. I mean, it's pretty rabid out there, you know, what people believe and think about all kinds of things. And I think what, and I wrote, and we wrote about this, or we tried to get about this in the canon of ethics. I mean, I think what, what, what we've got, we have to rise above that. We have to rise above our own passions and realize it's okay to be disinterested. Disinterested is not a bad word. I don't mean uninterested. Disinterested. Disassociate yourself, your own views, and your own predilections from the professional concerns and look at them objectively. Um, and when you're, when, you're, when you're able to do that, when you're able to walk away mentally from a, a situation, you can, you can find yourself giving your boss advice that is a little bit more sound. And when you want to object, when you, when you really believe you've got a case, you'll have more credibility when you go after it. Did that answer your question? It was a good one. Yeah. Admiral, we have another question coming in here from Lieutenant Sean Eklund. Fast file transfer was brought to the fleet by photo officers, and there's been very little effort beyond that to figure out how we're going to push video and still imagery from the sea. As time ticks by, we're seeing our networks at sea are changing, but we are not changing with them. Is there a plan for getting imagery off our ships in the next two to five years? <laughs> Is there, Chris? Test. Remind me to thank Sean when I get a chance, sir. Uh, actually, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Um, and we're dealing with this right now with the Eastern Med and the challenges of we, it, it, should those ships be called into action. Uh, we've got MCs aboard them, which is very good. And we've tested the capability. But it, this was a concern of mine as well. Are we going to be able to get imagery off those ships should we need to? I mean, I'm comfortable we're there. But as to the future of it, to Sean's question, which I think is a really good one, I, I don't know. And maybe that's something I need to spend more time focusing on. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> as you recall, I brought this issue up during a recent uh, director's board meeting indicating that FFT, uh, while it's still viable today, it has uh, a periodicity of about 18 months or so before the, the information assurance side of the house is going to shut it down. Uh, unless certain things take place. And all those things are being worked on. Um, Fleet Forces is, has been in touch with me. I've been talking to them about sort of the revising the uh, VI op order to help set that, you know, strengthen that requirement so that we can go to NAVC and present, uh, you know, this requirement in terms of uh, finding a, a follow-on solution to FFT or maybe even going so far as to buy the technology from the vendor and then developing it internally uh, so that we can keep up to up to pay uh, in pace with uh, some of these ship comm suites that are so, so radically different from other uh, other um, classes of ship so right now today we do a pretty good job of getting FFT to work on 90 percent of the platforms it's, it, it does require a lot of staff work. Uh, the N6 at, at Fleet Forces is, is encouraging the N6s on the ships to take the risk to use the, the application. The application uh, is in a, a new uh, revision so that it's, be, it's authority to operate or it's authority to be on ship is being uh, recertified. The folks at DMA have a certified surfer, so the information assurance area is being addressed so that we can maintain our current capability. But the discussion is really quite new as to how and what the follow-on will look like. Uh, so we're really in the requirement stage there. OK. All right, that's good. I mean, so I'm just I'm glad to know we are looking at this and how to get it at Sean's concern. And it's, again, Syria has brought anew to me the, the concern. I mean, I didn't even know I needed to have uh, until you know, I faced the situation where we were really concerned about being able to get imagery off quickly. 
Uh, so that's good to know. Thanks. Well, look, I'm about four minutes shy, so I'm going to wrap up here. Um, this is the fifth one I've done. I try to do these once a quarter. Um, uh, and my plan, my intention is to keep doing them. Uh, and I'm going to continue to keep writing to you as well. Uh, but if uh, you have any feedback, let me know what it is. If these are not helpful anymore, we, we don't have to do them. Uh, I find it useful for me to get to know what's on your minds. And um, again, my intention is to keep doing it. But thanks very much for your time. I know it's valuable. I'll give the rest of the, uh, the morning back to you. I appreciate it very much. See you.